Hi everyone, it's Raymond here, the Member of Parliament for Gillingham and Raynham. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Sir Mark Clyde Grant for my second In Conversation with Raymond Chisty. And today we'll be looking at a number of different issues affecting the United Kingdom from foreign policy, defence and security perspective. Sir Mark is one of the United Kingdom's former top diplomats. This includes serving as the Prime Minister's National Security Advisor from 2015 to 2017, and the United Kingdom's Ambassador and the Permanent Representative to the United Nations from 2009 to 2015, and Director General for Political Affairs at the FCO from 2007 to 2009. And also the United Kingdom's former High Commissioner to Pakistan, where he served from 2003 to 2006, which at the time was the United Kingdom's largest mission around the world. 2021 is key year for highlighting the United Kingdom's position on the world stage. The UK has just finished its term as president of the UN Security Council and is hosting the G7 in June and later in the year hosting COP26 conference. On top of this, the government is shortly expected to publish its integrated review of security, uh, defence, development and foreign policy, which will define the government's vision for the UK's role in the world over the next decade or more. So with that, Sir Mark, absolutely delighted to have you with us today covering a range of topics uh, affecting the United Kingdom's position on the world stage. My first question to you is this. In February, just recently, the United Kingdom hosted the presidency of the UN Security Council. How important are forums such as the UN Security Council in projecting Britain's influence? Well, good morning, Ray, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I think our presence on the UN Security Council, our permanent presence on it, uh, only one of five countries to have that role. And therefore, the ability to chair the, the, the council, as we did last month, is a very important platform for Britain um, going forward. Because it's worth remembering that even after Brexit, Britain will be a member of more international organisations than any other country in the world. And foremost among those is our role at the UN Security Council. So although it's in a sense an historical position that we inherited as a result of the Second World War, and we were part of the group that set up the United Nations in 1945, it is today a platform for projecting our influence abroad and therefore is extremely important. And we've always used our presidency of the UN Security Council to promote our international role. So for instance, last month, uh, the United Kingdom was showcasing two major issues. One is the link between climate change and conflict, and the other was the importance of rolling out vaccines against COVID-19 across the world. So two really important topics that we were able to showcase because of our presidency of the UN Security Council. And can I just ask you a specific question on that? And you've touched on it. We've, we've showcased two specific areas with what's going on around the world at the moment with the various different challenges. Are there any other areas you would have liked to see the United Kingdom push on um, at that stage? Well, I think there are a number of other priorities. I think one opportunity that was perhaps missed is, is around the uh, freedom of religious belief, for instance, something that you've been very closely involved in, uh, Ray, yourself. Uh, and I think uh, that is a sort of issue, a global issue, a common good, which we can project through our position at the UN, and I hope that we will be doing so in the future. But the two subjects that we did highlight, I think are extremely important ones, very topical ones, and so I think it was right that we focused on those. And can I just thank you so much for your brilliant uh, support and advice on the advisory board when I was the British envoy. And I know we specifically put forward recommendations to deliver on the Security Council resolution in the Truro report on freedom of religion or belief. So thank you for all your advice and support on that. My other question on this specifically is this, how do you judge the success of diplomatic events like the UK presidency of the Security Council? 
Well, I think you've got to judge it by results. Um, so there would have been about 30 meetings that we would have chaired during the month of uh, February on a whole range of issues from, you know, Cote d'Ivoire to Guinea-Bissau to Syria to Yemen uh, to Libya, uh, Israel, Palestine, etc. And have we been able to push that agenda forward during the month? So I think it's if you judge it by by results. Have we pushed the dial forward? You're not going to make a radical breakthrough every time you you chair the Security Council. I did so on four occasions during my time in New York. But you try and make incremental changes or bring new issues to the table that perhaps haven't had the visibility they should have had. And that's where I think the, the global vaccination program comes in. Yeah. And just finally, before we move off from the Security Council, um, during the Security Council period, we also had the, the regrettable uh, and unacceptable situation in Myanmar, you know, where we had a military takeover. And I know it was covered by the United Kingdom and a resolution was uh, put forward to support the role of the rapporteur, you know, for, for Myanmar. What more could be done or what could have been done to further press on the democratic uh, situation in, in Myanmar? It's very difficult to change a situation. There's a military coup in a country. Um, the UN can condemn it. The regional organization can uh, condemn it. Um, and if it breaks out into widespread violence, then there are options for even tougher action. But I think uh, the fact that the whole United uh, Nations sort of came together in the form of the UN Security Council and indeed the Myanmar ambassador himself to the UN essentially defected um, uh, live as it were and condemned his own uh, government, his own new government, is a signal that the international community will not stay silent when this sort of event happens. And that must give some comfort at least to those protesting on the streets and potentially risking their lives in favor of uh, democracy. So yes, was it a perfect democracy before the coup? Probably not, no. But it was certainly better than the 50 years of military dictatorship that what was then Burma went through and now uh, what we're facing in the future. So a flawed democracy is always gonna be better than a military dictatorship. And so I think it's right that the UN Security Council should at least express its condemnation of what has happened. Got it. And can I just move slightly over now to the G7? The United Kingdom will be hosting the G7. Um, and what can you expect from the G7? And what kind of issues do you think the United Kingdom should be pushing at the G7? We will now be having President Biden will be in the United Kingdom. You know, we're led to believe for that. The United States is now back, you know, as some say, leading uh, from the front. So what can we expect from the uh, the G7 and what are the kind of issues that you would like to see on that? Well, I think some of the same issues will be taken forward. So I think there will still be a big focus on the COVID recovery program. How is the global economy going to recover best from the COVID uh, pandemic? I think there will be a lot of preparatory work pushing countries to make commitments in advance of the COP uh, climate change summit that you mentioned that will take place in Glasgow in December. But there will be some additional elements too. And I think the most important one is probably China, because Britain has used its presidency of the G7 this year to invite three additional countries to come to the summit. So Australia are coming, India is coming, South Korea is coming. And together that makes sort of 10 democratic, powerful countries, all of whom have a vested interest in what is happening in China, how is China behaving in the region and what impact that is going to have on geopolitics more generally uh, and the global economy. So I would expect China to feature quite strongly uh, at that summit in June. And, and just on that, so Mike, I've got specific questions on China, which I will specifically come to just a bit later. But at this point in time on COP26, one thing that's been said in the past that and a criticism that has been made, uh, you know, post the Paris Agreement um, was that a number of promises are made, but there is no real firm commitments across the board. How do you ensure that there are promises along with firm commitments to, to deliver on what we all need to deliver on, on climate change around the world? Well, this is always a challenge, Ray, for any international agreement. 
Um, you can promise anything, and if there's a change of government, you can then renege on that promise. And a particularly at a time when the global economy is under pressure, individual countries are under economic pressure, the temptation to um, withdraw from some of your prior commitments on climate uh, emissions, for instance, you know, it will be great. So it is a challenge, there's no question about it. And at the end of the day, there isn't really anything apart from peer pressure which can force countries to stick to their commitments. So it's a two-stage process. First, you've got to press countries to make those commitments, and they're made on a national basis. You know, each country has got to make its own commitment, and that will be a key part of the uh, COP26. But secondly, you've got to exert peer pressure in order that they stick to the commitments they have already made, even when times get tough, as they are tough in 2021. I totally get that. And the question with that, and I'll come back to this in a minute, uh, if we're going to get a global approach to this, you also need China to commit to, uh, to its obligations. So if it's not at the G7, at the table, and then you ask it to commit to its obligations at COP26, how do you balance the two together? Well, uh, you know, countries are quite good at compartmentalising these issues. So... Right. And you see that every day, to be honest, in the UN Security Council. You might be hammering Russia in the morning on what they're doing in Ukraine, Crimea, but in the afternoon you can cooperate with Russia on counterterrorism against uh, ISIS or Al Qaeda. So uh, that's not impossible to do. Everyone recognizes that, however wary we might be of China on cybersecurity or, or geosecurity, nonetheless, we need China. Uh, to cooperate with China on some of the big global challenges like climate change. And actually, China's not been too bad on, on climate change. I think uh, there were other countries like India, which will probably be a bigger challenge um, in actually making and sticking to ambitious targets. And, and, and just, just on that, if I may just move over, and you've covered it briefly, it's security issues, you know, in terms of how do we engage with different countries around the world? You mentioned uh, Russia there. So let me just go on to the next area which I want to cover. And that is the Prime Minister made a statement on the progress of the integrated review in November, where he said the United Kingdom will be spending two point, uh, 24.1 billion increase in defence spending, which is great. However, can I ask you specifically, given the changing nature of conflict, what would you say are the biggest threats, both conventional and non-conventional, to the United Kingdom security at this point in time? I think, I mean, the Prime Minister has said that this integrated review, when it gets published, and it might be published as early as this month, um, will be the most radical reassessment of Britain's place in the world since the Second World War. I think that may be a slightly exaggerated claim, to be honest. I don't think because our basic threats that we're facing haven't changed fundamentally since the 2015 security defense review that, that I oversaw as national security advisor. So the main threats are things like uh, state-based threats from Russia, um, potentially from China, global instability and being sucked into conflict overseas, the terrorist threat, the cyber threat of uh, espionage and hacking and attacks on the critical national infrastructure, the erosion of the rules-based international order, health pandemics, you know, these are all the major security threats that this country faces, and they haven't changed fundamentally. Now, the response to them does change a little bit as technology uh, develops. So, for instance, I would expect to see in the integrated review, we've already heard some uh, brief prior briefing of it, that there will be both an increase in the defence budget, but a switch of emphasis from uh, infantry soldiers, from tanks, towards more money spent on cyber and technological threats. So the money will be spent in slightly different ways, for instance. We've already seen the merger of the Foreign Office and DFID um, to put diplomacy back at the centre of the concept of global Britain. We've already seen a reduction temporary, I hope, in the aid budget, for instance. So all these will be wrapped together in a, um, a concept of an integrated approach to facing Britain's security threats. But I don't myself think it will be such a radical departure from the past, uh, perhaps as you might think. 
Yeah. And can I ask you specifically on that, with regards to the, the conventional um, policy that we have on defence, um, I've just got a, uh, the, a sort of public tweet by the chair of the Defence Select Committee, Tobias Elwood, on the 24th of February. He said, now is not the time to cut our tank numbers to 150. And then underneath that, there's a caption, UK 150, France 200, the USA 6,300, China 5,800, and you've got Russia at 12,950. Um, what, what would you say to uh, somebody in, uh, uh, in Tobias Elwood's uh, position who takes that view on the, the threats and uh, pose the UK? Well, I think there's an element of special interest feeding, to be honest, uh, in that. I think, look, the defence budget is increasing. He's happy, no doubt, with that. But you can't spend all your money on everything. You have to make choices. And the reality is that how valuable are heavy tanks going to be to the British Army in the future? What sort of wars are we going to be fighting? Don't forget that the tank was designed and the reason we developed the tank was essentially to uh, stop the Russians invading across the plains of Eastern Europe. I mean, that is not a realistic prospect today. We don't need the tanks for that. The second purpose the tanks were used for is if we had a major expeditionary uh, war like we had in Iraq, for instance. But of course, it turned out that the tanks we had that were designed for Eastern Europe weren't actually very useful in the desert uh, in Iraq. So, you know, and probably we're not going to be doing those sorts of expeditional um, warfare in the future either. So I know I would disagree with Tobias. I mean, he's and but I don't think he's right on this. And can I just put you another question, you know, and it's another one from Tobias because it covers defence. Another tweet that we have, it says, heavy lift is vital in supporting our overseas commitments. Cutting our heavy lift by a third would dramatically impact a wide range of ops, including NATO commitments, humanitarian work and supporting our special forces. And that is specifically with reference to RF, RAF Hercules. What would you say to that? Well, I think he has a better point there, because what is important is not the size of the army, but the deployability of the army. So we have a relatively small army compared to many countries. But what is important is how many of those armed forces can you deploy overseas in a mission, say, if you want to go and help the French in, in Western Sahara against uh, Al Qaeda there, if you want to support the Americans going into Syria or whatever, how many troops can you deploy overseas at any one time? And that is important. That's why the emphasis on special forces is important. Uh, the announcement recently that the Marines may get involved in more covert uh, operations. And it's for those types of operation overseas that you need heavy lift. You've got to be able to lift equipment into theatre so I think uh, Tobias Elwood is right that we need to focus on deployability and supporting that deployability. I don't think he's right on tanks. And can I just ask you specifically on that, and you've covered, uh, you've, you, you've touched on it, is with regards to troop numbers and deployability. And there's some reports that there'll be a reduction in troop numbers um, in, you know, in what may be coming forward. Um, it, and, and putting that in comparison, to the other point you raised, which is the UK now taking a, a bigger role in peacekeeping missions around the world. So the UK has recently deployed 300 troops as part of the UK mission in Mali, which is great. And it was welcomed by parliamentarians from across the board. Do you see there being a, a contradiction between sending extra troops in to UN missions around the world, which is absolutely right and proper to do? Um, and I know you've uh, previously uh, supported this initiative. Um, and and at the same time reducing overall number of troops. Is there a contradiction in terms there or not? No, not necessarily, because, um, you know, at any one time, a huge percentage of your forces are in barracks or in training or um, in reserve, as it were, to support the civil authorities or to, to be deployed overseas. They're not actually deployed. And having uh, an army is expensive. So the more that the higher percentage you can deploy at any one time, I think is very important. And to be honest, we don't have a brilliant record of that in this country. We have a lower percentage of deployable troops than France, for instance, has, which is a comparable 
uh, sized army, if you like. And um, this was an issue I raised, you know, when I was national security advisor, how come the French can deploy so many more troops overseas than uh, we can? And the, the answer uh, from the generals often was, well, we're better trained than the French. And if we fought the French, um, we would beat them. Well, yes, that's fine as far as it goes, but we're not going to be fighting the French. And I think sometimes we uh, overemphasize the, uh, the quality of the training. Of course, it's extremely important, but we underestimate the importance of being able to deploy relatively small numbers of troops overseas quickly and effectively. So I'm delighted that the government has made a commitment to be more engaged in UN peacekeeping. Um, you know, as a permanent member of the Security Council, we are responsible for mandating all these missions around the world. And there's about 21 uh, UN peacekeeping missions around the world. And yet we relatively few uh, participants actually in those missions. So we did deploy last year, for instance, in South Sudan on a temporary basis, some engineers to help build the infrastructure for the mission there. And now we're supporting France, as you say, in, in Mali. And I think that is the right way to go. But we're talking here about packets of three, four hundred uh, uh, troops going in. Um, and that's the sort of deployability that is so important. And can I just ask you a specific question on that? Um, and in terms of working with France and working with other international partners, as we're looking at, you know, defence and security, after the United States, you know, who, who would you say is the United Kingdom's strongest security partner? Oh, France, undoubtedly. There's no question uh, of that. Um, we have something called the Lancaster House Treaty, which is a defence treaty uh, agreed with France um, 10, 12 years ago, and is very important. You know, UK and France, um, irrespective of Brexit, are still the two main European players on defence, and the French know that, we know that. So we will always look to France first, um, after the United States, which is our biggest security partner, obviously. And, and can I ask the question on that? And just, just on that, um, with regards to, and um, as you put it, our closest security partner after the United States is France. And, and you also know that the United Kingdom has is part of the Five Eyes uh, Information Intelligence Sharing System. France is not a part of that. And France has huge intelligence capabilities in the Sahel. So from your experience and from your expertise, would you say this now will be the right time to uh, expand the, the Five Eyes intelligence sharing system and look at having countries like France in there? I think that's a very interesting idea, and one that the government should look at uh, very, very actively. Of course, it does require um, the agreement of the other five participants. And traditionally, I think it's fair to say the United States has been a bit cautious about uh, bringing France into the Five Eyes community. But I think from the UK's national security point of view, I can see many, many advantages in doing that. Uh, as you say, the UK and France are very close defence and security partners, and France has a, a réseau, a, a network of uh, intelligence assets that we don't have, and in parts of the world that neither we nor the Americans have, like the Sahel. So I can see every advantage in, in exploring that possibility, yes. And then can I just ask you another specific question, um, just moving away from the um, international threat, well, partly it's linked to international threat, but also to a domestic threat. You know, there was around 800 British citizens who went to fight for Daesh. Um, there were British citizens radicalised in the United Kingdom and went to fight for this uh, uh, evil entity, uh, ISIS Daesh. Um, how does one address that threat and now that we're seeing the defeat of Daesh militarily the ideology is still a big threat you know to to peace and security around the world how do you um when you are saying the position that you were in as a national security advisor how do you assess that threat now to the uk and link to that um what do you do with those individuals who are now in camps uh, in uh, in syria um because some experts would say leaving them there in those camps poses another threat from the UK because they get further radicalised and they then disperse into other parts of the region and then pose a threat back to the UK at a later stage. How do you address that threat? This is a very difficult issue and one that the National Security Council has grappled with for, for some uh, years now, um, Ray. 
you know, I support the government's position, which has always been that if we can uh, keep these people out of the UK, then that would be better. But that is itself challenging and poses risks. So if one looks at the totality of the British nationals that went to fight for ISIS, nearly a thousand or so, about a third of them died, were killed in some way, uh, about a third have returned and are considered not to pose a major security threat, and about a third are still uh, somewhere in the region. Um, and Shamima Begum was one of those uh, in that last category. Now, because she had dual nationality, because she had the option for Bangl uh, Bangladeshi nationality, uh, she was excluded from uh, British nationality and prevented from coming back. And the government has just won a court case in the Supreme Court, uh, which justifies that decision. Now, the reason behind that decision that was taken is that it's very difficult to prosecute anyone in the United Kingdom for crimes that were committed in Syria because the possibility of gathering evidence in a, in a conflict zone is obviously uh, formidable. And so the risk is that you bring the person back, you want to prosecute them for the crimes that they have committed, but you can't get the evidence that will stand up in, in court. And this is the challenge. The Americans, if you like, have solved that challenge over the years because they don't always prosecute in the United States, they can be put, people can be put into Guantanamo Bay more or less sort of indefinitely. Um, that will change, uh, started to change under President Obama and will change further perhaps under President Biden, but that has been the policy um, uh, of the United States. Other countries have a slightly different legal system and therefore it's easier to prosecute people once they return. But for the UK, it's, it is quite a challenge because if you accept back into the UK, people who you know potentially pose a threat uh, to our security, you have to expend a lot of resource in monitoring them, um, screening them uh, on arrival and potentially for much longer, which ties up intelligence agencies, law enforcement agencies, which are needed to um, fight against, prevent the ongoing uh, threats that this country faces. So I'm uh, sympathetic to the way that the government has approached this, but as you rightly suggest, there are challenges because if people are kept in camps indefinitely overseas, is that going to radicalize a new generation of people? And also, are you just exporting uh, your problem? Because there's no doubt that some of these people were radicalized in the UK before they went to fight uh, for ISIS. So it's going to be an ongoing policy challenge. I wouldn't be surprised if even the Supreme Court decision is appealed uh, to the European Court of Human Rights. So I think it's a policy area that is likely to evolve um, further in the future. And tell me, just, just linked to that um, specific point, I know some European countries are looking at with regards to the return of some of these individuals, you know, to see if they assist the security services or if there have um, they've been two year exclusions from the countries to see how they are, uh, you know, how their mindsets are changing and then bring them back. And the reason some have said this um, is on the basis that if they're kept uh, in those in that region and they disperse around that region, they become a greater security risk to us in the future. So how do you yeah. balance the different competing uh, elements there? Well, I think that is the challenge is, 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 are they going to pose a greater threat to this country if they're in this country or if they're in the region where they can pose threats, you know, either uh, at a distance or indeed to British interests around that the Middle East region. Um, so that is a challenge and I think each case needs to be looked at individually. As I say, about a third of the people who went have come back, have been uh, screened and have been um, compartmentalised as not posing a direct threat uh, to the UK. Uh, so that's, that's good. Others have been killed in the region, that's fine too. Um, it's the third category that is a challenge. Um, and one has to balance out the different uh, risks and interests and legalities uh, in each individual case. Yeah. And just finally, on, on the security perspective, um, from seeing what's happened in the uh, events in the United States with the, the, the insurrections in, in the capital with right wing extremism, you know, around the world, you know, back in the United Kingdom, you know, how much of a threat do you see, uh, you know, with um, right wing far right extremism poses as well as left wing extremism, as well as dash inspired extremism, because 
the direct threat from a conventional level to another country intervening in the UK through militarily is, is pretty minimal. You know, if that, it's other actors um, that pose a real risk. So where would you place those kinds of risks for the United Kingdom at the moment? I think in, in terms of terrorism risk, um, the overall risk is, is severe. I mean, it's important, but the government has, and the law enforcement agencies have had a great deal of success in disrupting terrorist attacks since the horrendous sort of series of lethal attacks we faced in 2017. There have actually been very few um, over the last few years, and certainly lethal ones. Um, but the threat is still there. And there, there's sort of three main threats for the United Kingdom. One is a residual Northern Ireland threat, if you like, from the IRA, the provisional IRA. That threat is still there and has to be uh, managed. And you have the right wing threat. And I think that has uh, risen uh, significantly in recent years. Um, and of course, what has happened in America has an impact here. And that is a, is, a, is a real threat and has cost lives, including of members of parliament, as you know, Ray, in, in the past. Yeah. And then you have the uh, Islamist threat, if you like. Now, of the three, there's no doubt that the Islamist threat is still the most dangerous. It's the largest. But the right wing threat has increased and therefore resources have been and need to be deployed against that rising threat, as well as not losing sight of the legacy threat from the provisional IRA. Uh, 